All right, we continue our Bible study series these days as we continue to talk about race. And each week I've been bringing uh, two different Bible passages. Uh, some, uh, one each week is inspiring and can be used in wonderful ways to bring about uh, racial reconciliation and cooperation and unity. And another passage uh, would have been used in the past to do really sad and un harmful, hurtful things. Uh, so I'll, I'll read both those tonight and, and talk about uh, the past a little bit, and then I've got uh, some extensive handouts from you that are for you that I'll get Brian to distribute in a few minutes uh, so we can be thinking about how some of those Bible passage, pa passages have been interpreted in the past and, and how they were put to use and how they got into people's minds and how they were uh, explained. So, our passages tonight come from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, so, in our list of happy, sad verses, as I call them, uh, first we'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14 and 25 to 27. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And 25, uh, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So how could those verses bring some inspiration or hope in terms of uh, racial reconciliation or racial awareness? We're all together in this life. Yeah, we're all together in this life as Christians, as the body of Christ. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, what your ethnicity is, Jews or Greeks, that's right. Kathy, you said what? One unit. We are, we are in one unit, that's right. And uh, we might be different, and we've been talking about that for the past few weeks. We are different. They're, each of us in here is different, and certainly each of our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ around the world in different countries of different ethnicities and languages are, are very different indeed, and these verses celebrate those differences. And say, and, and I invite you to keep reading that whole uh, second half of 1 Corinthians 12 as Paul celebrates all our diversity and how that's what makes a strong body, that we all uh, join together and we celebrate our differences, whether you're an eye or a foot or a hand or whatever. Uh, it's because we are all different that we can work together and, and be even stronger. So a good message, yeah, Wayne. I think that scripture speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think what the problem is the individual who reads that whether they call themselves a Christian or not uh, they have to believe that truth rather than uh, claiming otherwise mm -hmm. and having uh, a mindset of exclusion rather than inclusion that scripture is pretty clear yeah. to whoever reads it yeah. So it's a matter of whether we believe it as, as God's word or whether we reject it and say we want to have our own word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's look at our second passage. And oh, I did put extra uh, printed Bibles over there by the wall. I should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, so unfortunately, this verse is pretty clear and pretty straightforward. Uh, so 1 Peter 2.18 says, Slaves, submit yourselves to your master with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Mm. So, a tough verse to read, but it is in the Bible. 
And it is even in the New Testament, which we often say is the nicer testament, the one with more grace and more Jesus in it. But because that verse is in there and the verses that we've read over the past few weeks are also in there, it shouldn't surprise us that in the past, people who were in favor of a slavery system could say that they definitely had a biblical worldview. Uh, it, it lent itself to that as somewhat of an easy argument to make because it's right there in the Bible. It's black and white, right there in the Bible and other verses uh, that we've read over the past few weeks. So I was thinking about uh, these verses and how they might have been used uh, in the past, and I was uh, remembering the discussions that you all were having last week as we read the story of a um, Baptist ministry student who was black at the University of Louisville in 1954, and he said that a group of pastors, of local Baptist pastors, had come to the campus to have a serious prayer meeting because they were concerned, upset, that the Baptist Student Union, the college group on campus, would become integrated. And so they, they went to the campus to have a prayer meeting. And I heard someone uh, remark during the discussion, how could they pray for that? And I thought about it, and I know the answer very strongly. That's how they prayed about it. They prayed about it very strong because they felt that they had God and the Bible on their side is what they felt. So let's uh, track back in history a little bit and in a minute I'll give you some handouts with some historical quotes. But if we go back to the 1840s in America, multiple denominations like the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and the Baptists in the South had all broken away from the rest of their denomination in the country over their belief in slavery. So from the 1840s on through and into the Civil War, Christian churches and ministers in the South spoke, prayed, and reinforced, sustained the idea of slavery and the decision to break away from the rest of the United States so that they could keep their slaves. And the way preachers would talk about it, you'll read in a minute, was that God had entrusted them with the ancient, sacred, biblically-based institution of slavery. They felt it was their duty, their God-ordained duty, to own slaves, treat them how they were supposed to be treated, and make them Christians. Kind of like they had the mindset it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it, we might say. So that's what they would tell themselves, that God had entrusted them with this system. And whether they really believed it in their hearts or not, maybe they just came up with that idea to make themselves feel better, we don't know. Interestingly, when the South began to lose battles, more and more battles in the Civil War, many Southern churchgoers started asking the question, why is God punishing us? They would ask and they would lament when the Confederacy started losing more and more battles, which was, which was a really interesting question, that they would see those military losses as God's punishment for them. So when big losses would occur, they attributed it, those losses on the battlefield, with God being unhappy, displeased, and chastening them for their unrighteousness. Oh, okay. It's not that kind of unrighteousness. So a Baptist theologian at the time, John Dagg, compared Israel's breaking of God's covenant in the Old Testament, which led to their defeat and exile in the Old Testament. He compared that with the South's failure to honor the responsibility God had entrusted them of upholding the institution of slavery. 
that was their failure, that they didn't protect the institution of slavery well enough. And that's why God was punishing them, they felt. Which, again, ugh. Even after the Civil War, Southern churchgoers assumed that their loss meant they definitely had failed in their duty to uphold the God-ordained institution of slavery. They still didn't think it was wrong. They just thought that they didn't protect it well enough like they were supposed to. And indeed, Southern churchgoers saw slavery as a valid system of labor that also created, created conditions that were favorable to Christianity, Christian behavior, evangelism, they believed. And they would compare it to what uh, the Northerners lived by. They called them Northern capitalists, who in their opinion, pulled people away from the way of Jesus and into materialism. I think we can all agree that pulling people away from Jesus into materialism isn't good. Still, Southern preachers would champion slavery as God's will for society based on their biblical worldview, and they would rail against materialism as the actual big national sin that the country needed to repent from. Like I always say, you got to blame somebody. You're certainly not going to blame yourself. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to give some handouts. And I've got a front and back handout with um, 11 different quotes or kind of quote paragraphs from uh, mostly Baptists. There are some maybe Presbyterian, maybe a Methodist uh, as well, but mostly Baptists ministers and churchgoers in the 19th century just to see what they thought and kind of how they uh, justified what their beliefs were. So I think I'm going to split folks up in similar groups as last time. Uh, this, these folks right here, you are one group again. This table right there, you all can be one group. And then uh, Regina, Cecil, and Deanna, you all can come down here and have this be a group. So Brian, can you pass these out to every person? Everybody gets one. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you different numbers to start on, uh, just to make sure that different groups cover different quotes. And for all of your quotes, I want you to think about these questions here on the board. So I'll read out the questions. Uh, if you can't read them, and I can repeat them later if you need to. So. As you read the quotes, what do you think of their argument? How does it compare with what the Bible says and what you think? How would you respond to them? So those are the three questions I want you to discuss in your groups. Uh, let's see, this group right here, you all start with number one and just kind of work your way down. Uh, let's see, this group right here, why don't you all start with number uh, five or six and work your way down. And then back at the table, that group in the back, uh, you all start like with number nine and work your way down because those are kind of big on the back. Yeah. And uh, since there are, there, there's a lot of words here and uh, I, I'm more, uh, I want to invite more discussion and you all listening and talking to each other uh, right now because you can always take this home and read it later. So if you're reading something and it really jumps out to you and you want to say, oh gosh, uh, what, a, what a terrible thing to say, or oh wow, uh, I can see what they're talking about, or whatever you want to say, feel free to shout it out. You don't have to kind of wait for everybody to read everything. If you see something that you really want to say, oh man, I really want to talk about this right now then you go for it. So this group start with one, uh, this group, what did I say, start with like five or so, five or six, and then the table in the back start with number nine. And if you finish, uh, you're welcome to read the rest, but just to spread them out. And for folks uh, watching and participating from home, I will put this sheet up as an attachment in the video description below. And I will pause our video. All right. 
right, well, let's start kind of forming back into our larger group. These are good things that we could talk about for a long time, but I want to make sure that other groups kind of hear what each of you all have been talking about, uh, the folks who read other quotes. And I encourage you to read the rest of the quotes on the sheet, front and back, later on. And I, I meant, shame on me for not uh, putting on the sheet where I got all these quotes. I didn't pour through uh, ancient sermons or convention reports to pull them out. There's a Baptist historian named Bruce Gorley, and he has written many books and many articles on uh, Baptists before and during the Civil War. And uh, on his website, you can go month by month through the Civil War and see what different Baptist ministers and churches were talking about. So I kind of uh, took some of his summary articles and pulled out some highlights, but he has the full sermons, the full speeches, um, uh, everything that I, that I copy and pasted. Uh, so I tried to at least um, cite kind of who and where and when, and it was the, the, the really good Baptist historian, Bruce Gordley, on his website that had done the real research. So I want to throw that out there. Uh, what general thoughts, feelings did you have uh, reading over these quotes? Any kind of overview thoughts, feelings you had? Well, let's go through our questions. So, what do you think of their arguments for the quotes that you read? What did you think of their arguments? It was what? Well, what he said was it was a selfish motive. Ah, yes. Selfish. Hey, control, you can control. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think you're exactly right. It was self, it was trying to, to maintain that control, those selfish motives of having the power and the economic authority. And, and anybody who has some control or some thing or some power, the human inclination is to uh, cling to it and come up with whatever argument you can come up with to justify you keeping it. Yeah. Other folks, what did you think of the arguments that you read justifying? Yeah, yeah. So these, and that's a good point, Ray. These are all one sided uh, arguments on this side of the argument. Um, while I was looking into it, the, the, the books, the articles I was reading said not 100% of Baptist ministers in the South felt this way. A minority were against slavery, but they were encouraged to leave, or persecuted, or arrested, or chose to leave instead. And, and I think somebody maybe from this group had said that uh, it was so prevalent, this one side of the argument was so prevalent in the South back then, it was hard to, to even consider anything else. I heard someone say it's easy for us to judge now because we're not living in that culture. It, it, to, to get them to think about something else would be uh, to get a fish to think about what the water is like. You would say, well, what's water? What are you talking about? This is, this is it. This, this is everything. They were swimming in it in this one side of the argument. So it would have been hard to even consider the other side. I think, so it was mentioned, I think in a group about education. Hmm. If people are educated, uh, they are in a better position to do something different, to take care 
care of themselves better uh, and a way of keeping people down. That's happening around the world. You keep them from being educated and you can control them. Mm -hmm. I think the other part of that control is fear. There's people that were in control. And it, it's here today too that I'm in control. I'm afraid I won't give it up. These, these immigrants coming in, where did it all come from to start with, except if you're Native American? It's a fear of they're going to change right. our little box that we're in. And I, I don't understand that. If you ever need, if you ever want to convince somebody of something, fear is a strong convincer. And that's why it's used so often. Whatever the argument is, whatever the thing you're wanting to get, you see it so often. Oh, you should be afraid of this. So believe what I'm saying. You know, go along with my way because oh, there's all those things. So the fears back then, um, I, I assume, would be like, well, we don't want to give freedom to the slaves because then what might happen? They would they would do terrible things. You should be afraid of them. And you, you know, obviously this is God's will. It's in the Bible. You should be afraid of going against God's will. Uh, if you were to work towards uh, freedom, then that would be against God's will, because it's in the Bible. So yeah, that, that fear, pushing that fear factor uh, is a big convincer, unfortunately. It's used a lot. Mm -hmm. I think we're giving the bad people, the slave owners, too much credit. What do you mean? Well, I mean, we're saying, oh, they were afraid, they were fearful. They were owning people. Uh -huh. They knew they were owning people, and there is no way you can be a God-fearing person and think that owning people is okay. I, no matter what society you're living in, owning another human being is wrong, and they had to know that somewhere deep in those mm -hmm. black hearts. Mm -hmm. So, I totally agree, mm -hmm. Kathy, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna add to that. Gary and I have had rental properties in Asheville. We've worked with Section 8 housing for many years. Our government was doing things with fear. If we would have a lady that had three children finally find a job, and she was excited about that job, they would cut her Section 8 back enough so she could not pay her rent, so she would have to quit her job, go back to the apartment or trailer, and get her housing back up to where it was. Well, I think the government is controlling people that way. And I don't think, and this was white people, not black people, but there is the same thing with that. If you're poor, oh, and you have to depend on your government to take care of you, it's very sad because you're a bit of a slave. It, it's, I mean, we've lived it and we finally decided we could not do that, so we quit dealing with mm -hmm. oh, it. It was so sad. Yeah. It, it's hard to get out of poverty because there's so many difficult. things that are kind of keeping, holding one down. It's just so hard to get out. Yeah. yeah. All of the folks you just said, there's a lot of children who are working for social services for you, and you don't think that you're just unbelievable. For instance, if a woman is having a hard time financially, they would encourage her to release her husband. Then they could help support her and kids. But as long as she's living in the house, I wonder, like what Kathy mentioned, I always wonder, do, do people know, or maybe not consciously, but deep down in the bowels of their heart, they just have to know that it, it's wrong, what they're doing is wrong. And maybe that's where, and if I'm not even aware of it, they've convinced themselves, and like I said, maybe this whole argument of God has entrusted us with the ancient institution of slavery, maybe that was all 
just a you know a bunch of bull that they made up to make themselves feel better because there was still that guilt in their heart because you can't you know treat another person uh, like that and you know, dehuman you can't dehumanize another person without losing your own humanity and I, I just I wonder if that that guilt was there and they had to stamp it down inside themselves so deep that they couldn't even notice it anymore I don't know I wonder. Yeah. Well, how do their arguments compare with what the Bible says and what you think? We've kind of talked about what we think. We're against slavery. But how does it compare with what the Bible says? Which is an interesting question, I think. Love your neighbor as yourself. It does say that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this doesn't jive. Mm -hmm. That we are all one. Yeah. Yeah, we are, we are neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Yeah. Yeah, we're all one. Yeah. I don't know how you can, I don't know how anyone can argue that or debate that. That's a truth that comes from our Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you can try to change that or squirm around with it or whatever. That's, that's what it is. And if we believe as a Christian, if we believe that truly, then we can't disrespect people or treat them in a different way. We can't do that. I agree. I, and we all agree. And to the question of how could you do it, read the rest of the quotes on that sheet. That's how they did it. Yeah. And that's that's what they told themselves and their church members uh, to make themselves feel better. So we'll pause it here at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll pause it here. Uh, we'll, we'll keep talking next week. And um, uh, we didn't get to the last question, so if you think about that, maybe we'll pick up with the last question next week. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. For goodness sakes, I got a lot of makeup.